Good afternoon from Bethesda, Maryland, just outside of Washington, DC. We hope you are all doing well. We are delighted for you to join us today. Um, since March, we've had over 7,000 viewers on Zoom for our 26 online events. And we plan to continue these online events into the fall. One big event we wanna tell you about that isn't public yet is our intensive trade seminar, which we'll plan to hold virtually on Zoom in September. We'll formally announce it later today, but for those of you not familiar with the ITS, it's actually 12 individual sessions over three days where we do a deep dive on US trade policy, how it functions, and some of the key issues facing US and global policymakers. Watch your inboxes for information on this three-day event. Uh, when you take part in these events, I want you to know that you're part of a global trade community. And one thing we like to do is call out the names of a few of those people who are watching on Zoom so you have an idea who you are in community with today. So a welcome today to Peter Dillon with the Basque Trade and Investment Office, John Bleed with the Confederation of British Industry, Ambassador Don Johnson, the former congressman and author of The Wealth of a Nation, A History of Trade Politics in America, and Kellyanne Shaw with Hogan Lavelle's. Welcome to Peter, John, Don, and Kelly, and welcome to all of you. Today's our fourth session with candidates to be Director General of the WTO. Next week, we're pleased to welcome Ambassador Amina Mohammed, Kenya's nominee to be Director General. And the following week, we'll be hosting Ambassador Yu Myung Hee of South Korea. We're delighted today to welcome Dr. Liam Fox, the UK's nominee to be Director General. For those of you watching on Zoom, you should have received Dr. Fox's biography, but let me say what an honor it is to host you, Dr. Fox, today at this critical time for both your country and the global trading system. Thank you for meeting with the global trade community today. And Dr. Fox will be joined in discussion with two of America's leading trade figures, Ambassador Rufus Yerksa, the president of the National Foreign Trade Council and the former Deputy Director General of the WTO, and Wendy Cutler with the Asia, Policy, the Asia Society Policy Institute, and for over three decades, one of America's leading trade negotiators. If you're watching this on Zoom, you have the ability to post questions to Dr. Fox using the Q&A tab on Zoom. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can after the discussion between Dr. Fox, Rufus, and Wendy. Wendy, take it away. Well, thanks, Ken, and thanks to our viewers for joining us um, for our fourth interview of, with a WTO DG candidate. Um, before we get to the interview, I just wanted to share a bit about where things stand in Geneva right now. It's been a very busy week in Geneva as discussion of the selection process for the Director General, as well as the selection process for an acting Director General are underway. With respect to the Director General race, we're now in phase two of the process and that will last until September 7th when the various candidates use the time to basically get to, to campaign for the job and to get to know the members better. Um, this phase will end November 7th, uh, excuse me, September 7th, and then a two month phase, the third phase will begin whereby a narrowing process will begin, will, will be underway by the um, chair of the general council along with two other committee members. By tomorrow, the detailed um, narrowing process is expected to be agreed upon in Geneva. But overshadowing the, the process this week is a selection of an interim or an acting director general. According to the procedures of the WTO agreed to early, um, earlier this decade, um, it was agreed that one of the four acting, um, one of the four existing deputy director generals would become acting. Um, that is um, becoming a difficult process right now. The US apparently has nominated Alan Wolf, the, the American deputy director general to be the interim chief and that has not received um, support. So basically um, agreement is gonna be, is, 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 um, will be reached tomorrow one way or the other before the summer break in Geneva. And the way I see it, I think there are four possible outcomes, but I'll just turn to Rufus um, after I go through them to see if he agrees and where he thinks we'll end up. The first is that members will be able to rally around one acting deputy director general. 
The second is that there's some kind of rotation process either between the four deputy director generals or a subset of them. Third, we could see um, agreement on no interim, no interim director general, but just the existing deputy director generals would continue being responsible for their portfolios. And finally, and this isn't in the procedures, maybe um, the members will agree on nominating the chair of the general counsel, David Walker. So I think those are four options that are out there. Rufus, maybe I can turn to you based on your experience and what you're hearing from Geneva. Where do you think we're gonna to land tomorrow? Yeah, well, Wendy, you know, nothing is ever easy in Geneva as this demonstrates. And I think it's, it's an indication of, uh, you know, the fact that what's fundamentally lacking in the WTO right now and the real challenge for a new director general is, is kind of the lack of trust among the membership, which has led to a breakdown over a lot of issues. Um, in, in running the, the organization. <clears throat> and as you say, the, you know, the procedures call for the members to basically appoint one of the deputies. It was never anticipated that governments would nominate these people because serving as a deputy director general, you're not a servant of a, a country. I mean, I spent 11 years in that job. You're serving the organization. And so the fact that it's now become a bit of a national competition is problematic. I think it's, it's, highly unlikely that tomorrow they resolve this deadlock between them. I don't know about your four alternatives, Wendy. I think that, you know, one of the things that's being talked about is that, and I find this really hard to, to understand how it would work, but since each deputy has a designated area of jurisdiction in the secretariat that their portfolio covers, that each of the four deputies will just continue to run those separate areas uh, and then I don't know, I guess they have a college of cardinals sort of approach to, um, to running the place. Most of the decisions that will have to be made are purely management decisions and budgetary and other things. And, you know, this acting person who hopefully is only there for a period of months is not going to be pivotal in terms of setting direction policy wise. We'll have to see how that resolves itself and whether they do sort of come up with an approach like that, maybe with the general counsel chair overseeing the, the, the process. Mm -hmm. But it is an indication of how far apart these members are when they can't even agree on a temporary interim head. Uh, so we've got a lot of talk to talk about today. And Dr. Fox, this is obviously one of the big challenges. And Wendy, like you say, um, you know, there's a lot of different possible outcomes here. Exactly. We'll have to see how this plays out over the next 24 hours. I understand Geneva will then close down for the summer break. They're not going to be staying there for weeks to try right. and figure this yeah. out, right? No, they don't work in August, Wendy, even during COVID. But I will say one thing back on your point about the, the, the process of the permanent selection. I think that's likely to go a bit smoother. You know, it's accepted that this troika, the three members, it's the general counsel chair, the head of uh, TPRM and the head of the dispute settlement body, that the three of them will hold these confessionals. The plan is to do kind of three rounds uh, and they have individual delegations come in and list their four top priority candidates. And then the bottom three drop off in the first round. So you're supposed to go from eight to five in the first round, then from five to two, and then you have a sort of a, a final. So, you know, if we don't have a World Cup, if we don't have a World Series, at least we can have this as a kind of, uh, you know, there's a playoff uh, schedule and then there's a championship schedule. So, yeah. Well, never a dull moment because substantively there's so much on the plate of the WTO and now they're just facing these challenges, which a few months ago were unanticipated. Right. But is your view, Roberto Azevedo, he's not sticking around past August 31? No, he's gone. He'll be out the door. And so they're going to have to tackle this question of the interim. There will be an interim period. Who knows? You know, hopefully by November 7th, they have a decision, but you can never count on that. I mean, it's been held up in the past. It could it conceivably, the decision could be made earlier. It could conceivably be made earlier. I doubt that, but it could definitely drag on past November 7th. And let's not forget there's an election in the U.S. and that could complicate, um, you know, the U.S. position and the position of others uh, towards this. So we'll just have to see. Okay. All right. With that now, we're going to turn to Dr. Fox. Um, who is, um, as Ken mentioned, the fourth candidate for this important position that, we'll, that we're going to be interviewing. 
Um, Dr. Fox, perhaps I can just start and ask you if you could share with us kind of your vision for the WTO, your reform priorities, and really the skills and the experience that you would bring to this position. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, despite, uh, and a lot of criticism about it, I think the WTO is an excellent organization. I think it's got a huge amount of technical expertise. I think it's got a huge amount of, of residual knowledge. I think it's got great experience. What it doesn't have is political weight. And uh, that's why I think as the only elected uh, political figure uh, currently serving, I can bring a great deal to that with my experience in government at the highest levels, including as Defence Secretary and Trade Secretary in the UK government. And I think that matters because the problems we have at WTO are, are not uh, necessarily technical in nature. Of course, there are technical issues, but the basic problems are political. It's how we resolve some of the political issues that have already been referred to um, and can unblock some of the elements that are holding uh, progress back and making the WTO more relevant uh, to its members and to those we represent. And the first thing to say is that we cannot have business as usual. Uh, there is still, you know, this talk about whose turn is it, uh, uh, as though it's just a bobble being passed around. It's, it's a very key uh, decision for us all because we require the sound functioning of the global trading system. And there is a, a big point to make here that global trade was actually contracting before we got to the COVID pandemic. In Q4 of 2019, we saw a fall in both value and volume of global trade, which uh, is the result of a, num a number of things, a number of trends coming together. We've seen the trade tensions uh, in recent times. We've also seen the G20 countries raising their uh, barriers to, to market. Uh, back in the end of the financial crisis, only 0.7% of the G20 countries' imports were subjected to restrictive measures. By the end of 2019, that had doubled every two years to get to 10.3% of G20 imports, a, a figure that I think a lot of members uh, found shocking when I was uh, talking about it extensively in Geneva. So we can't have business as usual. What we need to do, I think, is to reinforce the importance of the rules-based system. Uh, we sometimes forget that we've taken a billion people out of extreme poverty in a generation, one of the greatest achievements in human history by uh, the mechanism of, of, of free trade. And that is based upon that rules-based system. And the uh, alternative to a rules-based system, I'm afraid, is a, is a power-based system uh, or what might, what might better be characterized as a, as a free-for-all or the uh, rule of the jungle. Uh, and I think that would be extremely damaging, not just to some of the small countries, which is what people tend to focus on, but you look like economies like the UK 31% of our GDP is exported, Germany 49% GDP exported, we would be hugely disrupted um, by uh, a failure in the rules-based system. The rules-based system, of course, has to have a dispute resolution mechanism. The top priority, I think, for the incoming DG is to get that in place because to have a rules-based system without a means of adjudicating disputes within that is, is nonsensical. And for many countries, the dispute resolution mechanism is the value added that the WTO brings and their membership brings. There are a lot of interconnected issues. Uh, the UK, uh, although I would be not the UK's candidate as such and not the UK's DG, but the UK nominee, uh, we have a, a very strong record on issues around development uh, and uh, DFID, of course, and we uh, meet our 0.7% GDP commitment to that development. Um, I, as Trade Secretary, was very keen to increase our aid for trade budget, helping countries to take part more fully in that rules-based system, including paying for legal representation for some of the smaller countries in Geneva. Uh, we have also been at the forefront of one of the issues that I'm, I'm most passionate about, which is how we get more women involved in global commerce. Uh, and I see that not just as an economic question, or clearly there are economic implications for expanding out the global workforce, including women, but I see it as a key developmental uh, and empowerment tool uh, that we should uh, want to take forward, which is why I said that we have to lead from the top. And if I become DG, then half of the senior team at Geneva will be women. We, we can't have the message going out that we want to encourage women in developing countries, for example, to have greater participation 
in the global economy, and then all the top jobs at, at uh, Geneva are occupied by men. Um, I think we have to be very clear about what the WTO is and what the WTO isn't, and that we are there to ensure that the global trading rules and laws are applied uh, impartially and fairly, and also that we see global trade uh, liberalize um, and widen the base that, so that more countries, more people, more companies come within that rules-based system. It brings inherent contradictions, I think, with it, but these are things that we need to, to manage. But the WTO is not the Security Council. It is not UNCTAD. It is not the World Bank. It is not um, uh, the UN. And although we all know from experience that it's impossible to maintain an entirely sterile environment in these different global institutions, we've got to try to stop as best we can uh, disputes between members in different areas being brought into the trading system. Um, and so we need to be very clear about, uh, about our function. And finally, how do we turn back the progress that has been made, if you want to call it progress, in the tide of protectionism that's been sweeping the globe in recent times? And I think if COVID has taught us anything, it is uh, beyond a shadow of the doubt that we now live in a world that is more interconnected and more interdependent. And yet the tools we're using in the global economy uh, have not kept pace uh, with the reality of the changes in that global economy or the global trading system. And the way I put it is this, um, that uh, trade is not an end in itself. Trade is a means to an end. It's a means by which we create and spread prosperity. Why does that matter? Because prosperity underpins social cohesion. Social cohesion in turn underpins political stability and political stability is the bedrock of our collective security. In other words, there's a continuum there. And I believe that if you interrupt that continuum, if you don't give people access to prosperity through trade, then we shouldn't be surprised at the negative consequences elsewhere. So if we are not giving people the ability to trade their way out of poverty, either by uh, restrictions on our markets or the failure of the system, we shouldn't be surprised if we see more mass migration or more political radicalization or even failing states that will draw us unwillingly into security vacuums. So uh, protectionism comes with a high price tag, maybe not immediately apparent, but it's still there. So I think these are huge challenges that we have. I think those challenges are primarily political. Uh, and I think that the conversations that we will have to have are best made by somebody who's actually operated at that level in political systems uh, around the world. And uh, I would hope that I would have both uh, experience and a skill set that could be brought to the use of the membership at the WTO at what will be a difficult time. It was difficult before COVID. It will be more difficult after COVID. Uh, and we need to have experience and clear heads as we navigate some of those choppy waters. Well, thanks for that. You put a lot on the table. Um, perhaps the first question I can raise with you um, would be to ask you to respond to three points that Ambassador Lighthizer has put forward with respect to what he's looking for in um, a director general. One is someone without a whiff of anti-Americanism. And I think you've been a good friend of the United States. We can probably check that box someone who recognizes the need for fundamental reform of the WTO. And I think you've outlined there um, more or less that, that you, you see that. And third, and this is what I really wanna ask you, he's looking for someone who understands that the current WTO rules are incapable of disciplining China. And so what I wanted to ask you, do you agree with that assessment do you think that rules can be improved or new rules should be agreed upon um, that can address many of the barriers that many countries are experiencing um, when trying to um, export to China, um, but also that their imports face with respect to um, unfair competition? Well, I've been called a lot of things in my time as a politician, but never anti-American. Um, <laughs> including, as we said, doing some of my medical training as a doctor um, uh, while I was in, uh, in the US. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, we can accept anything other than that we need widespread reform in the WTO. Let me give you just two examples. Uh, first of all, we need some internal reform in how the operation uh, is, uh, is seen by its members in Geneva. 
Uh, I've had 57 bilaterals in the last two weeks. Um, and in almost every single one of them, countries would say to me, uh, if you're a small but noisy country, you're listened to. If you're a very big economy, you get listened to. But there are huge numbers of countries in between whose voices are not properly heard. I think we need to look at how we set out and work the secretariat. I think we need to uh, perhaps look at the roles of the DGs to see whether we can actually ensure that all countries have uh, someone that they know will be their conduit into the leadership of the system. Uh, and I think that uh, we uh, uh, need to be spending more time just talking to our members. One of the things uh, that I was taught in medicine was, uh, if you don't listen to what the patients tell you is wrong with them, you'll never figure out what is wrong with them. Um, and I think that listening is a much underrated skill uh, in, in politics. Um, the other thing is I think that we need to update how the WTO operates. Uh, I'll give you one example. We've got the, um, the fishing, uh, fisheries agreement sitting and, and, and really uh, around that, the concept of sustainability, but we don't seem to be able to utilize through strategic communications, the use of many of those uh, NGOs and other groups out there uh, who are hugely interested and young people and social media on this question of sustainability, the health of the oceans and so on. And I think we do need to, to reach out uh, and to improve the relevance of WTO with wider groups in society across the globe by, by, by showing that what we are concerned about and the issues that are important to us are actually important to them. Uh, and there's become a disconnect, I think, um, uh, out there, which has actually sort of undermined our concept of shared endeavor. Uh, which was how we managed to complete Uruguay and move into the current phase, um, but sadly not make much progress since then. So I think there's, there's, there are different forms of uh, reform uh, that the WTO needs to undertake. I don't think it's about um, uh, focusing on any one country. I think all countries who have joined the WTO need to recognize that they need to follow the rules uh, set by the WTO and to which we have all already signed up. Um, to, to, to make that effective, we've got to get uh, an effective dispute resolution mechanism out there. Um, but I think we also need to focus on um, uh, how we take forward common challenges, uh, how we uh, take forward issues on e-commerce and, and trade and services. I was saying actually in a conversation here in Poland where I am at the moment today, uh, if you said to someone, if I sell you a digital code, for your 3D printer over the internet, have I sold you a good or a service? The WTO is not really able to answer that question very clearly, if at all. And yet these are questions that are really asked in the real economy. So for me, the, the key thing uh, is to be uh, looking at how we bring ourselves up to date uh, in, a, in a global economy that's very different from what it was in 1995. How do we get those services and tech uh, elements properly regulated within the system? And then of course, it's about making sure that all um, countries, all, uh, all the members uh, obey the rules. Um, you cannot join a club and then say, uh, well, I don't really like some of those rules. I'll, I'll obey the ones that I want and not the ones that I don't want. That's not how you get a coherent governance system to operate. If, if I can just follow up and then I'll turn to Rufus. How about the issue of industrial subsidies? That's one where there is a, a growing sense that a lot of the Chinese practices, but frankly, not just China, other countries as well, um, are um, unfairly subsidizing their industries, which makes it difficult for others to compete. Do you think this is an area where the rules do need to be updated? Well, someone made the, the point earlier, and sorry, I can't remember who it was, that, that a lot of it's a question of trust and cooperation, uh, but transparency will certainly be one of the very big issues um, that needs to be dealt with. I had a very interesting meeting um, at the OECD in Paris last week when the issue came up about how they dealt with the issue of transparency in aluminium production um, globally and how they had done a lot of work on that using everything from uh, 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 Zoom, uh, uh, Google Google Maps and uh, uh, a whole range of data that was out Looking there. Looking at smelters and yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And, and making estimates for, of production capacity as well as actual production yeah. from a whole range of data that was there. They said it was expensive, it was time consuming, but it was possible to do it. And I think that we do have to look uh, at ways in which we can uh, determine uh, more accurately uh, what we think uh, some of the objective data actually is 
where, where members may not be providing uh, the full information, we'll have to deploy a full panoply of, of, uh, of methods to be able to, to do that. But I think it is worth looking at uh, the work that the, the OECD did in this case. I found it fascinating uh, to go through that with them. Um, and I think that maybe we're going to have to, uh, if we want transparency, find better ways of verifying data uh, because, well, as President Reagan famously said, you have to trust but also verify. Uh, if we're able to do that, I think then we can get better cooperation inside the, inside the system. Rufus? So thank you, Wendy, and let me just pick up on, you know, you know, on the, the subsidies discussion you both just had, because if, if we think subsidies in the trading system were a problem before COVID, um, you can imagine mm -hmm. now with governments literally pouring trillions of dollars into government yeah. intervention in the economy all over the world, what kinds of problems the WTO is going to have a ref as a referee on subsidies. And, you know, I, obviously as director general, you can't uh, impose new rules on the members. You have to work with the members to develop them, but I can't imagine there isn't going to be a major effort to try to come up with better uh, rules about how we how we limit the damaging effects of those trillions and trillions that are being poured in, which gets me to the question of dispute settlement. I, I wanna know the extent to which you would agree with assertions that not just the US, other countries have made too, that there has been some problem with the appellate body um, overreaching in some of its decisions and maybe creating interpretations of the rules that the members never agreed to and that a certain amount of creative ambiguity which was left by negotiators and I was I was one of those negotiators in the Uruguay round um, that you know there needs to be a sort of a more realistic approach to dispute settlement in the future where you know, if there are more than one possible interpretation of the agreements, the appellate body gives more latitude than it has. I want, I just want to know, do you agree with that assessment? And how would you help to stimulate a resolution of the blockage that puts the appellate body back in business, but recognizes some of those problems of past jurisprudence? Um, yeah, I think it's the most urgent uh, uh, task facing uh, the next DG. As I said earlier, for a lot of members, uh, dispute resolution is the value that uh, being a member of the WTO brings to them. So there are a number of things. First of all, why did we move away from the panel system to the appellate body itself? It's because it was felt that it was going too widely in some of the um, judgments being made. And I think there is a widespread view. It's not just the United States. It's shared quite widely that the appellate body itself has gone beyond what was intended, which was a much more legalistic, if you like, interpretation of the rules, making it much stricter. There's a view that it's gone beyond um, some of those parameters. There's also the view that the length of time taken to resolve disputes undermines the system itself. If a big economy knows that it'll get a three year uh, competitive advantage by disobeying the rules before a judgment is made against it, there's quite an incentive um, to undermine the system by taking advantage of that. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the system of, uh, I think what I think is largely a, a misunderstanding about the concept of setting precedents um, by appellate body judgments. Um, and so, yes, I think that we need to tighten up the parameters and that we need to limit the number of areas that the appellate body can look at in coming to judgments. I do think that we, uh, well, we can't have uh, the setting of legal precedents that would bind member states legally in the way that would happen in other systems. We do need to have consistency in the way that uh, judgments are reached and looking at uh, what has happened in similar uh, disputes in the past for guidance as to uh, how uh, rules were interpreted makes uh, a lot of sense to me. Um, but the, the thing is that we cannot create law uh, and impinge upon the sovereign rights of member states um, through this process, uh, nor should we attempt to do so. But I do think that there is some room. And I, and I, and I say, uh, Rufus, we've, and we've had this conversation before, but I think that it's not just the technical uh, elements of these and uh, the political elements of them, if you like, it's also the timing elements and when it's easier for some countries to make um, uh, concessionary moves and when it's not. Um, and, you know, looking at uh, the position in the United States at the moment, of course, we're not going to see any concessions 
by the uh, US administration this side of a presidential election. People need to be realistic about their uh, expectations on timings in these things. It may be possible uh, to make uh, compromises on these things, but it's not always equally possible at all times to do so. Um, there are political realities that need to be taken in, into account, and often they may be the rate determining step uh, in any of these processes. Um, perhaps I can um, switch gears here a bit and ask you about the issue of developing country status in the WTO. I mean, about two thirds of WTO members um, self-declare themselves as developing countries, availing themselves to special treatment. Um, the United States and others have argued that that system needs to be looked at and changed and really that special and differential treatment should go to a much smaller group of countries that really need it. Um, do you think this, um, you know, how do you view this issue and is this something that you would want to put priority on um, if, you were, if you were to become Director General? So a couple of points on that. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we have to reassert that we are all aiming for the same point in terms of the, the rules. Um, we accepted when we had uh, a, an increase and a widening of the membership uh, of WTO that we would be bringing in countries with vastly different capabilities uh, in terms of their ability to apply those rules in the short term, uh, with the aim being that uh, assistance uh, in terms of their capability would bring them to the same point as everyone else over time. I think we've also had uh, some countries who seem to be taking the argument that um, they should be perpetu uh, perpetually exempted from those rules and don't need to come to the same uh, positions as everyone else. I don't think that's acceptable. But the point I made earlier, um, when you uh, join an organization on a certain set of rules, you have to apply those rules. And those rules didn't say you can end up in a different place. Uh, we accept that you can get to the same place at different paces, but not to end up in a different destination. I think that needs to be reiterated. On the question of uh, SDT, then I think that uh, obviously we want to be accelerating uh, the rate of development uh, of a number of those countries so that they are no longer, it's no longer realistic for them to claim that development status. Um, and that requires a, a whole range of, of different things to happen. Um, if I can just raise one of the examples that I had in discussion, one of the uh, reasons that some countries give is that uh, to, 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 for them to move into different categories, whether it's uh, whether they're measured as, as high income, medium income, low income, is the fact that it will take them to different levels of status in terms of, uh, of trade access, uh, trade preferences. And one of the things that has perplexed me a little bit, and you, know, you might be able to give me some, some guidance as to why this has happened, is it seems to me that there's a rigidity in this. If you look at some of those smaller economies, the small and vulnerable economies, um, the, the way that we measure that can actually make our own task more difficult. Example, uh, the, uh, some of those coastal or island economies that are subject to natural disaster, if we take a snapshot of their GDP per capita one year, they may be in a high income bracket. Uh, the year after their hurricane, they may be in a low income bracket. And it seems to me we should be using data on a rolling basis to give them five year averages, for example, uh, to, to dampen down some of those differences rather than having them oscillate between some of these uh, different categories, which is actually, I think, a disincentive for them to take some of those longer term decisions uh, that, that might affect the, the sort of uh, elements in SDT that we're talking about. So I think that we have to think creatively about how we take away the fear of some of these countries that if they, if, they, if they declare that they're no longer a developing country, that they may have additional problems. So uh, if we can if we can find ways to uh, ameliorate that, I think then we should be doing so. And it's where I think bringing in better data, uh, uh, bringing in some dampening mechanisms to provide more confidence, and that means working with the World Bank, working with the IMF, working with OECD to provide better data, then we can do it. The aim's got to be to help these countries out of that status, improving their capability so that they no longer have to be there, but we've got to make sure we don't have perverse incentives for them to want to stay in a place um, that doesn't actually reflect the real state of development. 
Wendy, do you mind if I uh, no, sort of try to get us back to the question of process? Although I love talking about the substance too, so it's it's all it's all interesting. I wish we had more time, but I, I want to. You know, this is probably a bit of more difficult question for you to answer with respect to the selection process, but I think it needs to be asked. You know, obviously you've been put forth by the UK government. I understand that you don't see the role of director general as a role that is a national role. In fact, you take an oath that you will not take any instructions from any government. And I understand that better than anyone having been a deputy uh, and that it is difficult to get people to understand that once you're an international civil servant, you're, you're responsible for the whole organization. But in the selection, given that you are a candidate from the UK, given the recent decision on Brexit, the fact that you're still negotiating your relationship with the EU and with many other countries, and that you're relatively new, the UK is new as a, as a truly independent member of, of the WTO because so much of the competency was in the hands of the EU before. How do you convince particularly European governments that they should support you in this process um, and do you think you're capable of getting that support? Because, you know, obviously you just left their club. Uh, well, um, and the question of taking instructions from a government, there are some of my colleagues in uh, Westminster who think that even when I was in, in the cabinet, I wasn't taking instructions uh, from a government. Um, the, uh, uh, I think I've, I've shown from a number of international jobs I had that I can be even handed and, and impartial and uh, apply the principles effectively. In terms of the EU, uh, first of all, uh, I think it would be very foolish of anyone to think that uh, there wasn't an emotional uh, element in the debate about, about Brexit. I've always argued that the UK should have an agreement with the European Union on trade. And even if we weren't to get one by the end of this year during the implementation period, we would still have to have those negotiations. We would still want to have a liberal open free trade agreement with one of our biggest trading partners. So I, I hope the desire is there as a, as a bilateral aim. I actually think that there's an, uh, there's an increasing um, importance in this debate that wasn't there before. And it is because of the COVID pandemic. It is because of a loss of confidence in the wider system. As you mentioned, a lot of these temporary measures coming in, in my experience in politics, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary measure uh, when it comes in. And uh, I think we need to, to guard against that. Uh, and I think that we, an agreement between the UK and the EU actually would now have a, a significant and importance uh, way beyond the bilateral importance of the agreement itself in the confidence that it would give um, about the uh, desire to take that global trading system into a more liberal direction. So I still very much hope, and I believe that that agreement could be reached um, with, uh, with goodwill and some uh, creative thinking on both sides. Um, when it comes to talking to the EU members themselves, of course, there is no EU candidate in this election and talking to uh, a large number, here I am in, in Poland today, having spoken to a large number of my EU colleagues, certainly amongst the member states, there's a clear view that the UK's agenda is, of course, much closer to the EU's um, likely agenda if the EU had had a candidate uh, in this. And so my uh, pitch to my EU colleagues has been, um, you need to focus on the challenges ahead. You need to focus on the agenda that the candidates will bring and whether you think they've got the weight and the political clout to actually bring these changes forward. And that to put the... Uh, politics, which we're all very well aware of, you know, we weren't born yesterday, uh, of the, uh, the whole of the Brexit uh, element. If you put that before uh, the ability to deal with the major challenges in the global system uh, and you get a candidate that is unable to do that, think of the damage that might be inflicted not only on the global economy, but uh, as an effect of that on the European economy itself. So it's a question of, of putting real economies, real jobs, real economic interests ahead of some of those uh, uh, political arguments that we're all too aware of. So um, I don't for a minute think that there won't be some uh, conflict in that, but I, from my discussions with my European colleagues, and it's not a commission, of course, it's not a commission decision, this one, it's of member states. They understand very well where the UK is coming from. 
Uh, they know that we are great and passionate defenders of the rules-based system. They understand that our agenda is very close to the agenda they would like to see. Our priorities are their priorities. And, you know, I just hope that um, they'll take a decision based on not where the DG might come from, as I hope other countries will not make a judgment on where the DG comes from, but the skills and experience that the DG can bring for the benefit of all the members. Um, I was intrigued and I really welcome the comments you made about trying, putting emphasis on boosting the participation of women in the, inter in the international trading system. Two questions here. What does that mean in practical terms in the WTO? Are there any negotiating areas, for example, where you think an agreement would really help women, um, um, you know, expand their participation in, in the workforce? And second, I was also intrigued by um, your pledge to um, appoint, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I heard of women, at least 50% of, of senior management in the WTO would be women. Does that mean in the WTO secretariat, or does that mean your, the, your deputy director generals or both? Can you give us a little more clarity on what that means? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, you, you, we all know what the uh, process has been in the past. It's like, uh, uh, which region, which country should be getting a job. My view is that we should set out the job descriptions. If we have to reform the rules of the DDGs, we should do that. We should set out the job descriptions. And then we should say, um, give me um, whichever, whether it's a region or a country that's chosen to provide that personnel, give me a choice of a male and female candidate. and Let's pick the best ones for that job description. The other way round of let's picking the personnel first and see if we can get the job that best fits doesn't seem to me to be a particularly meritocratic or sound way uh, of doing that. So it would be across the, the top team. I, I haven't been very uh, precise about uh, making it the DDGs or across the rest of the cabinet, for example. Um, but uh, I have said the senior team and I would want to see that reflected widely. Are there elements that we need to look at in terms of the uh, WTO well I, I would look at things like the e-commerce agreement I really believe that getting uh, women into trade through uh, online trading and some of the other tools that are available um, makes uh, progress on, on that front uh, all the more uh, necessary uh, I think that uh, uh, particularly in developing countries uh, we can utilize that as a tool of empowerment with with two provisos uh, where we will need to cooperate with other uh, bodies. The well, number one is is flow of finances, uh, and that's flow of investment uh, and flow of capital, particularly micro capital. How do we help uh, talk to the other uh, the international financial institutions to help that happen? And the other is the skill gap. How do we use our development budgets of the huge number of sovereign states who are sending development money to help improve uh, the state of training? Without which, uh, that that gap uh, would become a, a fatal flaw in that particular plan. So I think it has to happen at a number of levels. Some of them fall inside the WTO, some of them fall in the interface between the WTO and some of those other organizations I mentioned earlier. Um, but taking a more holistic view, actually on a lot of subjects I think is, uh, is required. It goes back to my argument of understanding what the WTO itself is, but also how it works with some of those organizations in a more constructive way. If I can give you a, a slightly unrelated uh, issue, um, which is how we measure trade. So one of my, my big beefs in recent years has been that if we measure trade purely in gross terms, we will actually exaggerate the differences in surpluses and deficits that we have. Um, and of course, that uh, produces its own narrative. If we move to uh, my preferred measure of trade and value added, and we can improve our data to have that up to date, I think it gives us a much better picture of what is actually happening in the global economy. And I think that drives our narrative in a different direction. So uh, using information uh, that's available, using better data uh, to look at a whole, a whole range of issues, uh, how, how we are getting uh, financial flows to women, how do, we do, how do we measure trade? These are all ways in which I think we can update uh, and improve the functioning of the WTO to make it uh, more effective and make it more relevant because we can talk on, you know, on, on nights like this, we can have webinars and we can have discussions about abstract concepts uh, concepts of the value of free trade. 
But unless we can actually make it real, we can turn it into jobs and prosperity and hope for the next generation, then I think that we'll be too far removed from the people that we would actually like to benefit. If I can jump in, um, we wanna take some audience questions, if we may. Um, thank you, Dr. Fox. Um, so we had a, a several questions come in. I'm gonna to try to combine a few of them um, into a couple coherent questions. Um, but uh, a couple of them have to do with uh, agriculture subsidies, a very uh, uh, personal issue for many countries. Um, certainly uh, the US has its own uh, types of agricultural support, including as a response, the president has uh, provided aid to farmers to, to compensate them for losses based on its China trade. Um, a lot of countries uh, are very protective of their agriculture, their farmers. Uh, but this is also one of the thorny issues that prevents uh, progress on other issues. So how would you go about addressing some of these, the agricultural subsidies that are, are, are around the world? Um, why is agriculture in a separate uh, uh, box, as it were? Uh, because these are such difficult issues and because agriculture is literally an existential issue uh, for many uh, countries around the world. Um, you know, we have to, and the COVID uh, um, uh, pandemic will have a, an impact on our thinking here. I think that there is the danger that the pandemic will accentuate the differences in income between the richest and the poorest countries, which actually might make some of these discussions more difficult, which is why I think that the new DG has to try to move them on as quickly as possible, if we can do that. Uh, clearly, the wish to remove distorting subsidies and distorting barriers uh, to entry uh, is, is still there. It's still a, uh, an explicit uh, aim of the organization, um, but it's proved much more difficult uh, when countries seem to want to, if I can paraphrase this, to remove all the distortions in the agricultural system except the ones that benefit them domestically. Um, and uh, that falls, a whole, lot of, a whole lot of us fall into that uh, particular trap, I think. But, but we, have to, we have to do that and why? Because we've got to realize that a growing proportion um, of, of people on our planet are dependent on an open and free market in agricultural goods for their food security. Um, and that, that proportion is set to double between now and 2050. Um, and I, I go back to my point, Ken, that you know, if people are unable to access the prosperity they need and unable to access even the basic elements like food that they need from a free and open system, they'll find other ways of doing so. So I think that there is a real imperative that we give additional uh, efforts and additional political push to this because um, I think it's going to become uh, an even more and potentially even more difficult issue to resolve the longer that we leave it. And uh, alongside the fisheries, we need to give some impetus to this before we get to MC12. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I want to uh, pivot a little bit, but kind of stay in the same realm, which is um, with COVID and the economic slowdown that's going on around the world, the U.S. economic numbers for the last quarter were, were dismal, mm -hmm. and it's certainly a global problem. Um, do you see a possibility for the WTO to take the lead in a post-pandemic economic recovery? Is there... Uh, obviously, rounds can take years. The, the world maybe doesn't have years to try to bounce back. How can we, what kind of role could you take as, as leader of the WTO to help spur economic recovery around the world? So I think there, I think there is a very key role uh, in this, uh, which goes back to the vision that we had when we created the WTO about what its function was and the value of liberalizing trade. The first thing to consider in that is how will we react to some of the uh, weaknesses uh, that will be perceived in economic systems as, as a consequence of COVID. I think that uh, if you look at things like uh, just-in-time manufacturing supply chains, for example, there'll be a view that um, we have tilted the pendulum too much towards efficiency and not enough towards resilience. I think the first reaction to that will be that we will hold more stock um, and that companies will be tempted uh, to do that. I think, secondly, there will be some onshoring um, uh, 
try to uh, ensure greater reliability of supply. Um, I think that the, the danger is that we will fail to fully understand that the greatest resilience lies in diversity of supply in whatever uh, area of the global economy we look, and therefore keeping an open uh, and liberal global trading environment is in the longer term um, our best security. I think that for countries to look at the current situation and say we must do everything ourselves is, a, is fails to understand some of the domestic problems that can come if you get uh, industrial uh, problems that disrupt your own domestic supply. So onshoring and the concepts of economic nationalism will not necessarily be answers to this resilience issue. So I hope that our answer to that is at the WTO to say, the reason we set up this organization is that we recognize that the best way to, uh, in an interconnected world and to maintain our resilience was open and diverse sources of supply. Uh, I think that needs to be done. I think that there will be, however, um, differences in the types of recovery in different types of economies. If you look in the UK, for example, our retail sales have already rebounded to the sort of levels we saw pre-COVID, but our service sector is not responding because the key element in the service sector is confidence of people in their ability to interact with other uh, people in the service sector. So I think that we might see a, a more of a struggle in some of the countries with big service sectors uh, to rebound quickly. Um, and uh, that, that may uh, alter the sort of shapes of recovery uh, that we're seeing. Um, again, it goes back to my, the point that the more we can do to bolster confidence in the system, the better. Uh, and that means the vision word. I know it's not very popular in contemporary politics, but we do need to give people th this idea that shared objectives um, are, are a way in which we give our political classes the permission to make the compromises that are needed to take some of these things further. But we'll have a lot of issues around notification. We'll have a lot of issues around some of these temporary measures uh, having a tendency to remain permanent. And again, that's what the WTO will have to look at to see whether we're introducing further distortions, um, not uh, for the reason of introducing them themselves, but for, uh, for, for reasons of, uh, of, of public health that came in during uh, this. And, and we'll have some, frankly, we'll have some unavoidable things for WTO to deal with. We've got um, problems uh, with the uh, amount of container ships that were tied up at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we've got reduction in civilian aviation, which has meant less air freight being carried. They, they will taken together, they will mean disruptions in, uh, in both supply and price in the global economy. And then we've got the people orientated problems, uh, the lockdown of people, meaning less SPS inspections being taken, less certification on technical barriers to trade, uh, fewer people involved in the investigation of anti-dumping complaints, for example. There, there are going to be dislocations now that we unavoidably have to deal with that we can't do anything about. And the more we're able to prepare our membership for that, the less I think we'll get the this, this sort of finger pointing that would further damage the trust and cooperation on which WTO depends. So um, if I can, I want a um, really interesting question that came in that kind of addresses your candidacy, but also um, three of the current eight nominees come from Africa. Um, six of the nine DGs of either the GATT or the WTO have been European. Um, how do you, if you're pursuing this global agenda, how do you reach out to some of those developing countries and countries that maybe don't, haven't felt like they've had a leadership role in this global system that's been led largely by the United States, Europe, and a handful of others, that they are part of the system and that the, uh, the issues you might address in an upcoming round would be ones that would uh, meet their needs? Well, I think they should listen to the arguments of the candidates. They should listen to the agenda that the candidates are setting and then see whether um, they think they've got a credible track record. I think that uh, the track record I, I had as a member of the UK cabinet uh, in my role as trade secretary, my support for things like the She Trades program globally, um, my personal support and increase for aid for trade um, and our wider development agenda operating through the UK, through DFID, for example, uh, is testament 
to the fact that we take these issues very seriously. Um, and I, as, as in most things, I think it's not uh, the address um, of the uh, candidate that matters, it's the agenda of the candidate uh, that matters. We cannot be in business as usual. We cannot simply say it's our turn, therefore we should get this job or that job. Let's try to set out what we need in terms of an organization and then see who we think can, uh, can provide the answers. And even if you set out the, the right prescription, who can carry forward the right treatment, who's got the political weight to be able to talk in capitals uh, about the solutions that are required. Uh, and that is why I think there are tr there's tremendous talent amongst uh, the other candidates, and I, I wouldn't say a word against them. All I would say is that as we make this decision, we must be cognizant of the fact that uh, we need, I think, an elected politician with experience um, to carry this job forward into a turbulent uh, area for global trade. We've, we've gone through a whole range of those issues. And um, we are not, uh, we don't need uh, technocracy or bureaucracy at the top. Uh, we have lots of that already in the EU. We, we have a huge amount of capability. What we lack is political leadership. Um, and as I, as I see the clock just about to tick in my last couple of seconds, um, I think that's an appropriate point on, on which I should finish. Thank you. You're, the clock is, is expiring and we know you are coming to us from Warsaw with a six hour time difference. So we know it's getting a little later in the evening though. It seems still light. Um, um, we are gonna wrap up. Um, I wanna see if Rufus or Wendy have any final thoughts they wanna share before we close the session. Just thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. It really was a pleasure. Um, Hope we I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if I can count this as a, a sort of multi-bilateral, which case I could count it's it as number 58. <laughs> well, certainly the audience that we have on the session is multilateral. You can trust that. <laughs> um, Rufus, any final thoughts? You're muted, Rufus. Sorry, great to have you and best of luck for the rest of yes, your- Yes, best of luck. We, we didn't get to a couple of questions. There were some people who wanted to go deeper with you on state subsidies and uh, China's reluctance to address some of those issues, plurilateral negotiations. There's a lot of other topics that we haven't been able to get to, the length of time disputes take to resolve. Um, we will share those with your team so that they can see some of the questions that came in. Really grateful to you and uh, the people you work with who've been advancing your candidacy. Uh, we are grateful to them for their help in setting up the session today. Thank you, safe travels. And everybody out there who's watching, wear a mask. And thank you. We're uh, we're very open to some of those um, ideas and uh, suggestions. If they can be fed to my team through you, we'd love to uh, have a look at those. Happy um, to share. Thank you. As I said, uh, uh, listening uh, is is not something that uh, politicians are necessarily uh, uh, thought about doing. But uh, as I say, some some the bits of me that still are the doctor sometimes understands that. Uh, receive can be even more valuable than transmit. Thank you. We appreciate that the doctor is in the house <laughs> and, and are grateful for your time. Thank you, Rufus. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Safe travels, everybody. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye.